your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Tonight my guest is Amy Blackthorne and she's going to be talking about her new book, Protection Magic. Now, Amy's a professional intuitive and the best-selling author of Blackthorn, Blackthorn's Bot- Botanical Magic, gee, many, sm- um, Sacred Smoke, and Blackthorn's Botanical Brews. She's the founder of Blackthorn's Botanicals, and she has a certification in aromatherapy and was ordained by the Order of the Golden Griffon. Now, anyone who wants to ask Amy a question during the show, um, and you're listening live, and if you want to share a comment, that's good, too. Um, and you're not in the Para-X chat room, it's not too late for us to have you inside with us at paraxradionetwork.com. And we've got a lot to cover, so I'm jumping right in. Hi, Amy. It's nice to have you back. Hi, Marla. So glad to have you. Well, you keep writing the books, and you will <laughs> keep coming, I hope. Um, <laughs> but this this is a really interesting um Book and it's kind of a, maybe a backstory to it too, but um, it's a guide, um, a witch's guide to keeping us physically, mentally, and spiritually safe and healthy. And um, you're a witch, but you also worked in executive security for nearly 15 years. So, who knows better about protection than you? But mm-hmm. was that partly the incentive to some degree for writing this book? It's funny because I wanted to write this. The protection magic itself has been a big focus in my magical practice for, you know, a little over 25 years. Mm. And so when I wrote the, per, the the proposal to write this book, I was excited and I put all my stuff together. But I didn't mention my previous life, my, my mundane life in security. <laughs> that was the genius brainchild of uh, Judica Isles, my editor. She just mentioned it in the... You know, when she was talking to the pub board, said, hey, you know, by the way, Amy does all this for her actual job. She's she knows what she's talking about. So they were actually able to they added the physical self-defense portion in their discussion. And I was overjoyed because it never occurred to me that I'd be able to put my mundane security brain and my my witchy brain in the same book. Well, yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of similarities um in general, between the mundane world and our world sometimes. Um, so <laughs> the way you did it, um, you know, the book is is broken down into three parts, um, mind, body, and spirit. And as you might recall from previous visits, again, I tend to jump around to topics in each <laughs> section of the book that catch my eye. So, you know, put on your seatbelt because it might be a bumpy ride here <laughs> and there. <clears throat> but I want to start out um, with the mind. I want to, it's psychic security. I mean, obviously, we all know the importance of having a mind as opposed to being mindless. But sometimes mindless people don't know they are. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the mind isn't always our best friend because sometimes um, when everything is going just smoothly, for no apparent reason, we slip down the rabbit hole. And, um, you know, it, it's... Not only the outside factors that harm us, we shoot ourselves in the feet a lot. Um, so self-harm, um, whether consciously or unconsciously, is probably worse than anything because it can be avoided. And let's talk a little bit about self-harm. I mean, define the, define what it is and how we can knock it off. 
one of the biggest things that we deal with in both our magical lives and trying to shoehorn magic into our day-to-day life is that niggling little part in the back of the brain that says, you know, things are going too smoothly. Is that a good thing? Is that, is, is that a trick? Like that where brain is trying to figure out, is this really where we're going? Uh, but a lot of times our own, whether it's a chemical imbalance, it's uh, trauma from previous experiences, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, there's a little voice in our brain that says, hey, um, I'm a little anxious because things are going too well. Like, it's, am I waiting for the other shoe to drop? Mm-hmm. And as magical practitioners, we know that our intuition can be guiding us, but it's a hard line to try and figure out the self-harm of either running about in circles in our minds or mistaking our intuition for our anxiety and our anxiety for intuition. So making sure that we can really clearly define those two pieces is going to be the hardest part in making sure that we're moving forward as empowered people. Because I I can tell you the, the complex PTSD is, it sounds a lot like our intuition when we're really in the middle of whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, okay, we're, we're, we're hitting this straight on and we're going to make sure everything's okay, but we're jumping at shadows. So it really helps to both have uh, magical friends as well as professional friends who you can check in with and say, you know, am I overreacting? Am I seeing too much into this? Is this my trauma talking? Like, where is, where's the line there? That outside perspective is invaluable in making sure that our magical will aligns with our needs in their in the rest of your life yeah i mean we just i don't know if it's a a, a trust issue or you know we're just not sure of ourselves um and then it becomes something that gets overthought Mm -hmm. and then the snowball starts getting bigger and bigger as the avalanche (laughs) grows and and but it's hard you know i mean it's hard to to distinguish like um oh did that come from spirit or did that come from my imagination? Or maybe I really didn't hear anything. You know, I mean, it, it's just really weird. And, and it's really it's a tough nut to crack. And when we add in the third option of, okay, was it was it really me? Was it really them? There's that, that dichotomy trying to figure out where the line is. And it's... It's sad because we need to be the people who are empowering others and we're sitting there having to second guess ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody does it. I mean, you know, you look at people and you think, oh, they're so self-confident and they're so whatever. And, you know, you don't realize that probably they've got the niggle in the back of their head, too, but they can just fake it better than the rest (laughs) of us can. You're not wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's totally crazy. Um. And, and okay, so let me jump um, to how we can how 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 can we fix it? I mean, is it fixable? It is what? fixable, but it takes a lot of intentional work. Uh, really helpful with therapy. Sometimes there's um, chemical interventions, and really sitting down with yourself in where you're at because. I mean, there's entire industries that completely revolve around us not listening to ourselves and not (laughs) embracing where we're at, but it's definitely difficult. Even if you are uh, going to the right therapist and talking to the right people, it still is a lot of work. It is not easy. Uh, Making sure that we sit down and frankly look at ourselves and our experiences, uh, whether or not we're contributing to the issues is not easy. It's, It's actually kind of painful, but it's so worth it when you're standing in your power and saying, yes, I'm a witch, I'm well, I am whatever it is, that is worth diamonds. Being able to say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm here and I'm better than I was yesterday or last year or two years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's coming like something to strive for rather than saying, well, maybe, maybe I could possibly do it. But, you know, you just have to believe like when you're casting a spell, you don't second guess yourself while you're doing that. And anybody that knows, you know, that they have something very confident that they do, this is one of those things that they can do, too. Absolutely. It just gets to the point where you have to say, I'm worth protecting. I'm worth nurturing. And the hardest part as magical practitioners is wading through the toxic positivity that comes out. Well, if you just think nice thoughts, you'll be better. That's not how chemical imbalances work, my love. 
It's just not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and here, here's another thing I want to talk about, um, psychic protection, because people often blame things on someone or something. Mm -hmm. And we hear a lot, oh, somebody put a curse on me, somebody, <laughs> blow, you know, this is what we hear all the time. Um, and in the book, it's really neat. You explain how to tell if you're cursed, followed by a curse threat assessment chart where the reader can check all the boxes and apply to what the person is experiencing. And then depending on how many boxes are in check, um, there's an explanation to grade their assessment. So, um, you know, you really have to get the book to do this. But um, what are some of the factors in knowing that you've actually been cursed as opposed to maybe just not wanting to take the blame for something you did stupid or something? <laughs> One of the things I really love is looking just outside of the words that you've created for your home and your space. Because if those things start to happen just at the edge, we'll say at the curb of the street. Mm-hmm. There's there's a car accident or the, the phone lines go out or it's just outside that perimeter that you've built up. Mm -hmm. It's a really good indicator that something is happening to your shields. They're still intact, but they're, they're getting closer to coming into the house. And having that just outside of your range of control, we'll say, is a great indicator that something is actually happening and it's not just us. When, we, when we're in our space all day, every day, especially people who are home now more because of the pandemic, we get to know what's, what our routines are and what sounds are and what creaks and pops happen in houses and apartments. But if it's just outside, it's not something that we're looking at all the time. So it's definitely will register more readily than if you're hearing creaky noises in the basement at night. Yeah, who doesn't? Um, <laughs> but yeah, because I mean, when you're saying this, I'm envisioning looking out in the front yard and just when you get to the street, all of a sudden the grass is turning a little bit brown or the tree is kind of, you know, weeping like a willow or, or something like that. That would be um, one of the ways probably. And I know and, and a lot of people believe in this and I, I think there's something to it. Um, when the ravens and the crows start circling your house mm -hmm. and it's, I mean, we have them in the yard all the time. I mean, that that's normal, but Sometimes they'll sit there and they'll squawk and they'll yell and they'll complain. And, you know, maybe they think we're stupid because we don't get what they're saying. <laughs> but, I mean, that's another thing that people see. You know, ooh, the raven. But they realize, I mean, they think that that's a bad omen, but it, it, it's not. I mean, that's just the opposite, I think. Yeah, they're seeing what's what's already there. The It's not causation is not correlation. So when we see them, they're they're saying, hey, there's something you should pay attention to, not we're a harbinger of nasty things. It's just the opposite. They're so in tune with what's going on out there. Yeah, well, and people go, oh, well, they, they bring messages from the dead. You know, well, maybe they do, but that's not their main thing. You know, it, it's like, you know, being the smartest um, raven on the block. They try to outdo <laughs> each other. I mean, I've sat in there, watched them have squawks and fights, verbal fights. You know, it's like they're really funny. I, I really like them. Um, but my favorite thing about them is that they can recognize people from yes. a very long time ago. So if you've done anything to a raven, that raven will not forget. <laughs> and they'll tell others. There was a really neat study released last week or two weeks ago where they had. Ravens that were kept in a, a large enclosure, everybody together, they had a place off to the side that wasn't visible, and they'd have uh, different people come in with a specific mask and be and be mean to the, the crows, just, you know, mm -hmm. yelling or making noises. Right. Uh, and then they'd, they'd put him back with his little crow friends, his little raven friends, and they'd take a raven who was not didn't see the nasty mask and bring him in, and the, the raven knows, like, that's a bad dude. They tell each other. <laughs> I like that. I mean, you know, if they didn't eat live prey, I would have one. I just can't, you know, I don't want to seem see to kill a mouse or anything from my part. But, you know, I mean, I think they're they're really highly intellectual. But I, you know, people are afraid of birds. I mean, a lot of people have a braid, a braid, a bird fear because um, I don't know from their parents or something. You know, all birds are bad, or they fluff in your face, or you know, they peck your eyes out. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I just think ravens are wonderful creatures and I'm very happy that they're around. They just crack me up because it's mm-hmm. like, you guys quit it, quit bickering. Are you married or something? Stop it. You know, they're, they're really <laughs> funny. I think it's childhood um, trauma left over from watching the birds when you're a kid. <laughs> <laughs> that never scared me. That's so weird. It really never did. But I had a friend, I I had a cockatiel for like 25 years, a little tiny cockatiel, you know, they don't do anything. But I had a friend every time she came over because I let the bird fly free in the house. um, She would like cover her head. That bird was coming close to peck her eyes out and there wasn't anything I could tell her that, you know, it's not going to happen. The worst is, you know, if he flew over and dropped a small little tiny bomb on her. But, um, (laughs) you know, I, I just... I think it's a superstition. I think a lot of people are very superstitious about birds in general. Mm-hmm. But I always, you know, I like them. Anyway, all right, I'm jumping now to um, <laughs> to boundaries because here's the thing. I mean, we've, you know, in ghosty things, um, mediums will tell you, you know, put up your boundaries. You know, turn yourself off. Don't let them in. You know, set your boundaries straight. But we can do that too, Um to keep us on an even keel because boundaries help a lot. Um, it's important that we know, though, that we can create our boundaries. Boundaries. So, how do we go about setting them in place? Um, and what exa- What are some examples of healthy boundaries? Oh, I love this. Healthy boundaries. The first one I always uh, let remind people is that no is a complete sentence. <laughs> you do not have to capitulate or offer explanations. It's not rude to be clear when someone says, hey, you know, I can you work this weekend? I, I really just want to get I'm I'm sorry, I can't. I've, I've got the kids have ballet when reasons are given. It makes it much easier for someone to refute your reasons and, mm-hmm. and push past your boundaries. So recognizing that no is a complete sentence is one of the most liberating and empowering things I ever discovered. <laughs> and that's amazing, too, because, you know, if you just say no, everybody looks at you waiting for the explanation, and then yep. you feel guilty that you really do have to explain, but then you get tongue-tied because you're trying to figure out more and more reasons as you're talking, which makes you really guilty. Um, you know, um, yeah. no. It's the justifications is, that shoot us in the foot. Yeah, but no as a sentence, I mean, that's really a brilliant thought, and, you know, if you can pull it off, but... What about people who say, well, I don't, I can't do that. I can't create a boundary. One of the things that really helped when I was trying to figure out where those boundaries needed to be was the understanding that if someone gets upset that you have created a boundary, that you've put it in place, it shows you that they're the person who benefited from you not having them in the first place. Mm. And so the people get the most upset are the people who are taking advantage of those lack of boundaries that we have. So making sure that you're clear, you don't, it's not necessarily rude to be clear. Um, Those people are the ones saying, oh, well, I guess I can't X, Y, Z. You know, I can't push this person to to take my workload anymore because they're, they're not going to, they're not going to help me out. Yeah. They're going to feel hurt. They're going to feel upset and those are things that they're going to have to deal with as adults i don't know if it's hurt so much as you know just really pissed off because they <laughs> wanted something you yep. know and and t- to take advantage and i mean not all requests are like that but setting boundaries um aside from saying no what are some other boundaries that we should be putting up and maybe don't even realize that we should when we get asked to do really anything the ability to say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to check in, I'm going to check back with you with that, because the people pleasing part of us that is based and lives in our trauma is one of the things that says, oh, hey, this is this might be this might be difficult. But being able to say, let me give some thought gives you the opportunity to say, do is this really something that I can and will do um, sticking to a budget? That's a great boundary, making sure that you're taking care of both in your finances and in your your day to day walking around, um, putting in place a, you know, self-imposing a bedtime is a great boundary because there's so many things that really could make a lot of enjoyment. You could stay up late, you could eat cake, you could read books and watch movies, but the you that's up tonight 
can be a little bit more hard for the day that it has to go tomorrow, the person that has to get up and go to work or deal with friends or responsibilities. Those are great boundaries to have for yourself, but in practicing them with yourself, it makes it a lot easier for you to give yourself the satisfaction of enforcing those boundaries with friends, family, and people in your life. Yeah. Now, see, I have a trouble with the boundary. When I start eating ice cream, I don't want to stop. <laughs> it's <laughs> terrible. But, you know, I'll just, okay, I'm, I'm done. I've had enough. And then I'll take another bite. Well, no, no, no. Maybe just one more. And, yeah. And, and so sometimes boundaries aren't as easy as they look, especially when it's something that you really like and want to do. Um, mm-hmm. But it is possible no matter what anybody says. I, you know, because I can't is, you know, the two worst words in the world. Um, because every time you say that, you just make sure that you don't. You know, you don't believe in yourself and you know that you can. But, yeah, boundaries are really important. It's just, you know, like if you don't want to do something, if you don't want to be around somebody, that's another thing because, you know, you're trying to be people pleasers and and there's people around you that just drive you crazy and you just have to learn to step away. And that's kind of a boundary too, isn't it? Absolutely. If you the A lot of the things that we have as quirks and we think they're, oh, you know, this is, this is very cute or this is very quirky of me. These go back to problems that we had as children that weren't recognized and we sort of build them into our behavior routines because we know that at that point it kept us safe. Whether it does now as an adult is to be, is remain to be seen. So if, if your parents belittled your feelings, they, they laughed or they, they caused issue when you said how you felt and you, ex- you com- expressed a feeling You may have a difficult time talking about your feelings as an adult, and you may not even understand that that's related. But the next step is to forgive yourself for having these uh, feelings and these issues, not respecting your own boundaries, and then move forward. Because we can't move forward if we're still blaming ourselves for something that happened 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that baggage is sometimes really hard to drop. Um, okay, um, now my boundary. Um, I, <laughs> I'm going on to m- jumping to something else um, because you have several exercises throughout the book. And in part one, you have psychic exercises. And one of those is creating an egg shield. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that. What's it for and how do you do it? It's one of my favorite protection beginner exercises because eggs are very universal across cultures and across spaces in the world, whether it's a chicken egg or a duck or a goose, it doesn't matter. The egg is pretty universal as an idea. So it protects the yolk inside. There's no holes in it. You know, cracks will let bacteria or other um, bad things inside of your space. So it's very easy for, especially new practitioners, to visualize and get that practice in visualization because it's one of the skills that is... It's foundational to a lot of witchcraft work, which can be difficult if you're someone with aphantasia or if you're uh, visually impaired. You may not be able to visualize these things because either you don't have a vision in your inner mind or you don't have that practice. So people have touched eggs. People have worked with them. They know what the, the texture of the shell feels like, what it sounds like when it cracks. So these are all really great senses to impart when you're looking at how to create this shield for yourself. So what we're thinking about is visualizing yourself from about three feet away so you can see all of you, your head to your feet. And we're putting you inside, instead of a a magic Linda bubble, we're using an egg. That egg is smooth and strong and contains all of the energy inside of you. And it makes it very difficult for people to project things onto you. It'll just slide right off your eggshell. So how we do this is by sitting and concentrating visualizing what an egg, what does an egg look like it's soft it might have greens or blues or browns as a part of that shell color and your egg looks completely yours no one else has your egg and never no one else ever will even if you explain oh there's a little freckle over here it's still going to be your egg and so what we do is in projecting this visualization of an egg over top of your personal space this gives you the opportunity to really put those wards or shields or protections in place in a way that is not only easy to visualize, but it's easy to access at a moment's notice. You could just snap your fingers and it's there, it's in place. Once we've really put it 
to the point where we understand not just what it looks like, what it feels like, what it might sound like. And the reason I love eggs so much is that once we get to the point where we are consciously practicing visualizing that shell over us to protect us from whatever it is. I mean, you can put one around your car, around your home, Mm -hmm. around yourself when you're leaving your home or your car. When we do that, not just connecting to ourselves, you can actually put those layers on top of your egg. You could paint sigils on it. You could cover it in brick. You can wrap it in cement. It lends itself to an infinite number of combinations that can change with uh, a threat level, with the time of year it is, with specific people that you have have to encounter. Just make sure that it stays whole and strong. I you know have people come up and say, "Oh, I, I really like this this egg idea, but it's not working very well." Okay, tell me what your egg looks like. Oh well, I left I left some holes in it so that like good stuff could come in. <laughs> My love. <laughs> <laughs> The good stuff can can come and go. It's fine. You've already decided that you're only keeping bad things out of your egg. So you don't have to keep... It's not a net. (laughs) It's an egg. We're going to keep it as strong as we can. We're going to make sure that it's empowered. And the neat thing about it is once you've practiced... You know, practice when you're sitting at a a light, when you're across town, when you're doing... Instead of scrolling mindlessly on your phone, just stop and think, okay, my shell is in place. So if it has holes in it, your, your yolk's going to leak out. It's not enough. We're going to keep it strong. <laughs> but when you're doing that, you're sitting in a traffic light or you're, you're at a lecture and your, your mind starts to wander. It's a great time to sort of mentally feel out how your egg is. Is there a thin spot on one side? Have you been sick? We want to patch up any holes that have been growing since, you haven't, you know, since you've been under the weather. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to just... Take a minute and mentally scan your egg and see if there's dirt or rust or a crack or holes that need fill in. And it's super easy. You just You just figure out the visualization that you like, whether it's spackle or brick or just cleaning it off with a little, little wipey ripe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just reinforcing it's, it. It just giving yourself the opportunity to say, yeah, I, I'm worth protecting. That's a very important point. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to go to break in a couple of minutes, but another facet of psychic protection that caught my eye (laughs) is um, protection through breath. I'd like to hear more about that. I love being able to talk about this because our inner foundation of all of our, whether it's magic, whether it's understanding therapeutic applications of magic, Reiki, everything comes back to the breath because if you stop breathing, I'm sorry, but there's not a lot we can do for you. (laughs) So making sure that our breath is centered in our experience as a whole person is really important. It's one of those senses we we call them parasympathetic because you can concentrate on your breath, but if you forget about it, it's it's not going to stop. You're not going to expire because you forgot to breathe. No one would be able to sleep. So being able to stop and center yourself, even just for a moment, in the place where your breath lives, gives you permission to understand, to devote attention to your own well-being. And it isn't derived from the the number of likes on your profile or the, the what you've done at work. It's just about where you are right this minute. And taking that moment, whether it's just some small in through the nose and out through the mouth, or whether it's square breathing, which is... You know, think of, um, you inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. And hold, two, three, four. It's a way of regulating your vagus nerve responses. And the, those parasympathetic systems in our body say, oh, okay, things are things are not what I thought. It's, it's much better now. I'm, I'm okay. It's a way of letting your body know that you're still here. Even if they're busy doing other things, that's the the basis of our, not just our protections, but our, um, our reaching outside of ourselves. We need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Our body, our mind, our heart, everybody lives together on the same page. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just, um, it, it was kind of like enchanting to look at that. Oh, 
protection <laughs> through breath. I mean, what are you blowing somebody's face that doesn't <laughs> really keep them far away? I mean, you know, unless you accidentally spit, maybe they'll back up. But yeah, so that was something that was really interesting. All right, um, we've got to take a short break. Maybe a few shameless plugs here and there. So everybody stay with us and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Stirring the Cauldron will be right back. So don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. warned. Missed an episode of Stirring the Cauldron? Then be sure to check out MarlaBrooks.com and check out the archive. And while you're there, check out Marla's weekly Witches Oracle card reading. Explore the site to find many great resources, such as information on tarot, oracle readings, metaphysical consultations, and links to all of Marla's books. That's MarlaBrooks.com. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening into Stirring the Cauldron. I just wanted to give you a quick heads up if you don't already know about the free weekly Witches Oracle Deck readings that I post on my website every Monday. Now, let me answer the age-old question before you ask it, which is, well, how do I know it's for me? And the answer is pretty simple. If you weren't meant to see it, you wouldn't know it was there. So if you're curious about what the week has in store for you, pop on over to MarlaBrooks.com every Monday and scroll down on the homepage, and there it will be. If you like tonight's episode of Stirring the Cauldron and the Archive Podcast as well, take a look at the show's YouTube channel and check out the dozens of shows that are there just waiting to be heard. New shows are added each week, and while you're there, why not subscribe? It's free. And if you click on that tiny little bell icon at the top of the page, you'll be notified when new shows are available. Just go to YouTube.com and then type in Stirring the Cauldron Pair X and the link will appear just like magic. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. My guest tonight is Amy Blackthorne, and we're talking about her book, Amy Blackthorne's Protection Magic. I just wanted to mention that non-witches can also benefit greatly from the book. Um, There's spells, projects, potions, exercises, and a whole lot more, and you don't have to wear a black hat to enjoy them (laughs) or practice them either. I think people are afraid, like if some people are a little bit dubious, and, well, if I do that, does that make me a witch? No, it doesn't. (laughs) It just makes you lucky because you did something good, probably. That's how (laughs) I would look at it. Okay, so we've covered bits um, of the mind section before the break, so let's jump into the physical security. And I'm going to talk about um, home security right off the bat because I love the concept of things like a home mirror box for protection, and I'm definitely going to make one and tell everybody how they do and what they're for because I I really like that. One of my favorite things uh, when I was going through a local import store, had decided they were closing. Uh, I think that was Bombay Imports at that point. Uh, and so I'm walking around looking at all the treasures in this beautiful clearance section, and I find the most beautiful jewelry box that is just covered with these beautiful mirrors. And my first thought was not, oh, so where to put my jewelry? Because I have, you know, I have chests and all sorts of things for my, my ritual jewelry. Instead, it was covered with those beautiful ornate mirrors. And my first thought was, hey, this would make a great talisman to protect our home. So whether you find a really fancy and ornate box, or you can go to your local craft store, Joanne's, Michael's, which I want to have you, they have little chipboard boxes and they also have uh, small pine boxes. And craft mirrors are right in the next aisle over usually. <laughs> so you can paint it protective colors. You can really glue those beautiful mirrors in place. What I do is all four sides that are visible and the lid, the bottom is your choice, depending on the style of box it is. It could be good, it could be bad. Um, And what I did was I enchanted this beautiful box with these beautiful mirrors. And what I did was I put a copy of my home's blueprint in the box. So we're making sure that the box is connected to our house. Magic is a sympathetic process. We're we're telling the box that it's related to this thing. 
And then I filled it with a beautiful nest of protective herbs, things that I wanted to bring into my home. I used lavender because I wanted things to be peaceful and sweet and calm. Um, I used lemon balm to make sure that it was uh, had the emotional purification and protection from the moon. All of these things made a beautiful nest to really empower and keep going that magic related to keeping the home safe. About once a year, I will empty out the herbs and, and compost those and then re-enchant the box, remind it of its purpose because it could forget after a year. It's only a box after all. <laughs> and making sure that that box lived in a prominent place where we won't forget about it. It gets, uh, there are candles burned with it. It gets reminded that it's a special project that keeps our whole house safe. And it's really neat to make sure that the box feels like a part of the family because that's where your home is. You know, if you if you name your home, you can put that on your, uh, the individual blueprint of your, whatever your home looks like. If you don't have a blueprint, you can check out Google Maps and take a picture of the building and print that out. There's so many ways to connect it to make sure the box knows what its job is. Mm -hmm. It's just getting to that point where you're connecting the box and the home so that it it understands it's a, it's a microcosm of the macrocosm. It's, you know, just a little piece to remind itself that it has a job to do. Mm -hmm. And mirrors are very good things to deflect things. And there was a chat room question that just came in and it's just like that. Um, she said, do you, do you think using bells on doors and windows will help protect your home? I absolutely do, because bells are very cleansing. That ringing sound actually disturbs any low energy. So what it's doing is making sure that it doesn't have a chance to lay around and cause havoc. So it's cleansing as a means of protection. rather It's a passive protection rather than an active protection. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's defensive rather than offensive. Yeah, I've got my witch bells on the front door, and there. so so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a cute little set of wind chimes that's magnetic on my back door, so even if I'm letting the, the dogs out, if I'm running around, every time that door opens or closes, there's just a little tinkling that says, hey, I'm here for you. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't have to sound like a cowbell or anything, um, you know, really clunky. It can be a nice tinkle bell, but it, yeah, it's it's I love it. All right. Well, okay. So another topic that I wanted to talk about was gardening and planting for protection magic. Now Mm. that includes certain herbs and plants for protection, both indoors and out. Um, Give us a few examples. What should we be growing? One of the things that we, um, when I first bought this property, it's backs up to a nature preserve. And so mm. I thought, oh, look, it's all secluded. It's got, there's be, you know, there'll be deer and foxes and all sorts of nature running through. What I didn't uh, expect was the appearance of something called wine berries. They, they look kind of like raspberries, but they're a little smaller. And so I thought, oh, hey, this, this sounds really neat. I, I really love these, these tiny little berries, which will take over if you let them be off, by the way. <laughs> but if a, if a plant can protect itself, it can protect you. So those little mm-hmm. wineberry thorns and wineberry canes, raspberries, blue, blackberries, those little thorny canes are a genius at making sure that your home is protected. Um, they're a biennial, so what happens is the first year, you'll get one spike. In the second year, you get two spikes. So when you see those two spikes, if you cut one of them off, the next year when it comes back, you'll get twice the amount of fruit on one vine if you would have, than you if you had left two. Mm-hmm. So feel free to snip that off. Um, I can, uh, I usually cross them under the welcome mat. You can do a little, uh, a little X over your front door. It's a very, very great passive protection for making sure it catches anything nasty trying to come in the house. So you can grow things. You can actually plant your magical garden depending on the shape that you have available and what you want to do with it. You can grow those beautiful plants. And in growing them in that specific shape, you're growing the intention of the magic as well as potential spell ingredients for later. So you can grow really sweet things to bring pollinators into your garden and make sure that it's got a lot of life and activity. You know, something like um, Sweet William, it's a, it looks like a little tiny carnation with a single bloom. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, like six inches tall. They, they smell like the clovey dra- uh, carnations that you're used to, but they're so beautiful at bringing in all those powers of magical addition and protecting your garden. Because every pollinator that comes into that space is bringing its own vibration, very mm-hmm. literally, mm-hmm. And, and making sure that that space is protected and loved. 
So you can go with the individual shapes if you wanted, uh, we'll say a square, if you had a square space. It's mm-hmm. great for blending stability to your magic. Um, if you wanted a triangle, it's actually got, uh, it's very common with deities with three faces. If you're dealing with a triplicate deity, uh, a rectangle is great for protection gardens because it has the stability of the square, but it's actually a little larger for that fortification aspect of it. You can put that magical fence in place and make sure that your home is just as magically prepared. And then come harvest time, you've got a lots of beautiful protection herbs that have been imbued with that protective aspect for all summer. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of other, I mean, like I have a lot of roses, you mm-hmm. know, and some of them, even the little baby ones, you know, they'll catch you good. Oh, so yeah. it, it's kind of good to have those little kind of traps, but you have beauty with it at the same time. Um, yeah, there's a lot of little thorny plants that, that can do do a lot of good. Um, but you also talk about working with plant allies, um, that they play a part in both healing and protection. And in case people don't know exactly what a plant e- ally is, um, what are they? These are plant spirits that we've talked about developing relationships with as a whole. So if, we, if we're gardening mint, for example, I love mint. Some people just hate, hate it because <laughs> it doesn't listen. It's, it's, it grows outside of its bounds. Mm-hmm. If we grow that mint... We harvest it, we dry it, we make a cup of mint tea with it, we enchant our beings with the love and protection of the spirit of mint. Great. But once that's gone, once you've put it in the compost and it's gone, that no longer exists, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's off in the compost. What still exists is the spirit of mint, the overarching personality, we'll say, of mint. Mm-hmm. So you can develop and connect with the spirits of individual plants as a spirit being. So if you really enjoy working with lavender, you can work with the spirit of lavender. The neat thing about it is you don't have to have any plant material with you, on you, near you. It's really impressive if you are able to do this because if you have a specific allergy, like I'm allergic to roses, uh, you can understand and develop the reasoning why that could be something that you're dealing with by connecting with that plant spirit as you would the spirit of, you know, your great aunt Josephine, which I, I do have a great aunt Josephine. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just came up. Yeah. Just, she must she be just said hello great. to you right she now. Really yeah. <laughs> so by connecting with the spirit of mint, you're able to do all the magical, beautiful things that mint as an ally can do. You know, it's, it's uplifting, it's protective, it's uh, purification. You can develop that relationship just like you would any other friendship and reach out when you need things that mint is capable of producing. So if I want to purify the home after I've been sick, I can uh, create that relationship with mint. Uh, I talk a lot about this in uh, Blackthorn Botanical Wellness, which comes out at Halloween. Yay. Making sure that we are available in ourselves to develop those relationships, just like if we have the time to make any other friendship. Mm-hmm. We're, we're doing the, that inner journey, that inner work that says, okay, I'd like to meet my my current botanical spirit, or I can look for a specific friend in, we'll say, lemon balm, because they're, it's such a beautiful sedative and it's really easy to grow. Mm-hmm. Those relationships are not only beautiful, but so meaningful and so um, willing to adapt to the things that we need as people in bodies at this point. So we really kind of need to know um, the essence of some of the plants and and what they kind of stand for or whatever, and then try and connect with the ally. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because if you don't have access to that information, you don't have, we'll say, uh, Black Thorns Botanical Magic on hand, (laughs) (laughs) you can go to the spirit of that plant and ask them what they'd like to bring to this relationship. You know, what can, how can we benefit each other? You know, mm-hmm. they may ask you to grow a patch of mint. That's fine. They may ask for um, just your time and attention because they are part of the spirit world and we're part of the embodied people. So there's always going to be things that they might not know that we know because we have bodies or we might not know because they don't. Mm-hmm. That's true. Well, let's take it one step farther. Are 
there any particular elementals we should try and make the garden friendly for that would also help us with protection? Absolutely. You can actually grow an entire garden just based on that elemental. Uh, so if you wanted to uh, nurture a relationship with fire to keep anything from actively attacking your home, you could grow all fire plants, we'll say in a square garden bed. So a lot of those materials will tell you that the elemental association of cinnamon is fire. Okay, well, that cinnamon tree in Sri Lanka is beautiful, but it doesn't have, I don't have a whole lot of access to it. I'm not going to grow it here. So look out in your backyard, look out at the plants that are native to your specific biome and say, okay, what can we, what can we look at this? How can we do that? And it's really easy. Uh, one of the ways we do that is look at the botanical family of that plant. So you can actually look, you, you can Google what the Latin binomial is for that plant and figure out what family it falls into. Uh, for example, the rose family is huge. Uh, it's almost all of them are protective and you can do things, whether it's um, every every fruit with a stone is a part of that family. Mm. Apricots, plums, peaches, pears, um, they're, they're all part of that beautiful magical family. So growing any of them could uh, grow your, your love and relationships. So just look at protected plants that can protect each other. Growing roses is a perfect example because mm -hmm. um, pain is considered hot. You know, anyone who's, mm -hmm. been, you know, whether you've burned your hand on a stove or you've been pricked by a rose, pain in that, in that way is hot. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, you can grow roses for that, that fiery connection to protection itself and really lay in those protections in your space. Um, I have a Vitex agnus castus. Uh, those of you who are not familiar, it is the chaste tree berry. Um, it looks... It looks a lot like uh, one of those plants that's technically illegal in most of the states in the country, um, as it has those palmate leaves, and it's very adorable. But it gets these beautiful spikes of purple flowers mm. that attract pollinators from all over. It is really handy. And it's funny because the berries that it produces um, are truer, uh, like a peppercorn, not like a, a blackberry. Mm -hmm. Those peppercorns are great for protection magic. They are, they protect uh, the uterine health of people with uteruses, uh, making sure that they bring on uh, stopped menses. You can actually make sure that if you have, uh, they're very handy for people with PCOS to make sure that those systems get regulated with your hormones. And it's funny, they used to grow it in the inner sanctum of different churches, the, the little churchyard, because the pepper that it gives really lovely flavor, very soft, warm. It's like a, a gray black pepper instead of like the pink or green peppercorns. But the neatest thing happened. They said, oh, well, you know, we're we're chaste men of God and this we're, we're going to keep this wood close to us. They'd actually take the wood from the chaste tree and make the handles for their eating knives. It's a soft, featureless wood. It's easy to carve, a lot like holly. Mm -hmm. And they thought, oh, this will keep us chaste and we'll be close to God. It'll be fantastic. What they didn't understand was the berries that they were eating because it makes a great replacement for black pepper and pepper was insanely expensive at that point. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize that it was the peppers were keeping them chaste because they were adding estrogen to these uh, gentlemen's bloodstream. <laughs> <laughs> See, live and learn, right? The hard <laughs> way sometimes. Yep, they were definitely chaste. <laughs> oh. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about personal security as opposed to home security because um, the book includes things like um, situational awareness, um, things you should carry on your person or in the car, how to spot when someone is following you, how to escape from things like zip ties or duct tape or rope or handcuffs or chains even if you've been abducted. And generally, too many helpful things to cover in this chapter. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it's all amazingly thorough. Um, and, and you have your own personal defense story. I mean, you know, you're, you've are you been doing that for 15 years or so um, physically, as you said, in the mundane job. So you know your stuff. Um, but you actually had a, a, a personal self-defense story that really kind of gave me the willies just reading it. And, yeah, I mean, if we, it's a long story, but if we can make it a little bit short, don't tell everybody. It was really creepy. Absolutely. When I talk about botanical relationships with plants, 
the people say, oh, well, do you, do you have any examples? I really want to understand what this looks like. And so every full moon, I do a lap around my property boundaries and make sure everything's kosher, everything's put together. There's no weird things. There's nothing standing out. And so one day about, goodness, six years ago, I was walking around the backyard and a line of poke had appeared practically overnight. It was, it was already hip high, but it was just along the edge of the fence around my backyard. And so poke is poisonous. So mm-hmm. I think, okay, if it can protect itself, it can protect me. What do I need protection from that I can't see that is behind me? You know, that's in the backyard, so I can't see it. And so I start going through the different areas of my life and trying to figure out what is this poke trying to tell me? And I found out that I had a stalker from my work in security. I was working at the uh, one of the most exclusive places in the state of Delaware as far as commercial property. At that point, I was still uh, working in the Welcome Center. So everyone had to come get me to get a badge to go anywhere in the building. And so I, I, it was a great job. I really loved meeting new people and chatting and getting, getting to know everyone in the building. And it wasn't until, let's see, halfway through my first day, I was training with uh, Bill, who was in the office at that point. We're, we're, it's not even halfway into my day. And we've watched people come and go throughout the building who are supposed to be there. And we see a, a I almost said gentleman, that's not a thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, a person walking out the front doors to go out and smoke had, you know, is being trailed by um, a woman. And Bill says to me, you stay away from him. Brooked, no argument, point blank, no, no capitulation. You stay away from him. Bill is, is probably six, five and probably 400 pounds. He mm. is, he is dead serious. Like, do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. You stay away from him. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's that's the thing that happened. What is what is what is going on? He says that man is dangerous. He says you look at the the woman behind her. She's got her her shoulders have a slump to it. She sort of has her head bowed. You can see that she's defeated and and just walking through life. And it's, he he says this. He does this to everyone. I'm like, okay, this is this is obviously something you feel very strongly about. I will. Avoid this person at all costs. I didn't understand it then, but being the new young woman in the building, I was the first woman who'd ever been sent to this uh, post because they had had issues in the past. Uh, they wanted to make sure that everyone was safe, and they I was the first person they expected to be able to handle themselves. So I just go about my business, and I didn't find out until Poke let me know something was going on that I had a stalker in this in this person. Uh, it turned out that he was a, uh, he's on the registered sex offenders list. Um, and he had the opportunity, the, the state in which he was convicted gave him the opportunity to hang out with them for 12 years. Mm. Now, for those of you who have not spent any time with this, bless you, <laughs> but it's very <laughs> difficult to, for someone to get arrested, tried, convicted, and to spend time in jail for these crimes. So the fact that this man spent 12 years inside should say something to you. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't know any of this, of course. Um, I just knew that he was, he would wait for me outside of work. Um, They would finish at 11 at one 30 and be released for the day. He would wait by my car for the half an hour between time he left and got off work. And the time I got, off work so he could just try and happen to run into me try to straight look look, i am not interested you can you know Mm -hmm. go away talk to somebody else like i'm not having it i'd get in my car and i'd leave and for probably four months that was that worked then it got cold okay it's too cold to hang outside for half an hour for somebody that's has no interest in speaking to you at, at all and i thought okay like this is this is going well until Thanksgiving came around and I think, okay, you know, things have been, been very generally quiet. He is, uh, was, he worked in the cafe for the building. So you had lunch, you wanted to go buy something. You had to walk in through there, but this building had insurance companies and lawyers and, you know, multi-million dollar companies that are, I mean, world known names. 
So they had a very nice cafe. They had the, a prep station with fresh foods. You could have pasta or whatever it was. It was a really nice place. So they had different sous chef stations, and his station was the where, right at the door. So you had, whether you walked in or walked out, you had to walk right past this guy. And so right around Thanksgiving, he starts to uh, try and talk to me at work again. He's like, dude, this is not happening. Like, take no, take no for an answer and go. So then he starts talking about, oh, I should, you know, it's it's cold outside. I should, like, come to your come to your other work. He knew that I, um, someone how he figured out I worked at the mall. I should I should come over there and um and Jeff, I should bring you coffee. Look, dude. I don't drink coffee. If I wanted coffee, my husband could bring me coffee. If I had any interest in you whatsoever, like it would have happened by now. It does not. Do not come to my office. Do not come to my work. I don't want anything from you. Leave me alone. As clear as glass. Bug off. All he heard was I don't drink coffee. You know that what really cool. freaked me out about it? What? Did he, he started telling you how he was going to kill you, right? Yes. Yes. That was the two days later. So when we looked at the pieces of all that, I had, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. they tell us not. So all he heard was, I don't drink coffee. So that was a Friday. And so Monday morning I come in and it's, um, it's lunchtime. I'm going to get my turkey wrap. <laughs> and he says, hey, wait a minute. It's, it's noon on a Monday. I'm getting some lunch. And he mimes holding two cups of coffee in his hand. He's like, I, I came to the mall and I was looking for you. I, I was going to bring you hot chocolate because you said you don't drink coffee. So I couldn't find you. And he's like, he's turning red in the face and he's shaking because he's so angry that he couldn't find me at the mall apparently he knew i worked at the mall but not where in the mall Mm -hmm. um and he's his whole face is bright red and he's shaking like i'm waiting for the steam to come out of his hair and so i'm like uh uh," and so i like i'm gone i grab my wrap from the other end of the thing it was far away from his like i can get i sit down i I try fruitlessly to, to eat my lunch and i see this dude he's staring directly at me no blinking no no not even hiding it just staring i gotta get out of here so i book it two days later i was back i, I was doing college on tuesdays and thursdays and so he's trying he tries to start this with me again like oh you look you look really tired look dude i work two jobs and i go to school full-time yeah i'm tired well he says <clears throat> maybe i can just kidnap you from your from your second work uh take you down to bethany beach um <clears throat> sexually assault you and i don't lie to you leave your leave your body for some mom with a kid to find like he's um, ordering a cup of coffee <laughs> we're gonna have to um let everybody get the book and read the rest of the story but you <laughs> you you managed really well thank um, you i want to say really quick one of the things that you have in the book um, that's really interesting is Taro spells for protection, including, you know, free form and major arcana. And I'm going to ask you to come back and we want to do a whole show on that because love that. Taro spells is really good. Now we've got about 30 seconds. So tell everybody what your um, website is, where they can find you, and we'll be good to go. The last, the first two chapters of each one of my books, you can find at amyblackthorn.com, free to download. I want you to know that this is something you want to love before you buy it. That'll take you also to my tea shop, blackthornsbotanicals.com, where you can look at the different audit. You can get signed copies of these books. All of them are available there. And I really love to give you some tea to try. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at amyblackthornauthor and TikTok at amy underscore blackthorn author. I just want to hang out with you guys, and and thank you so much for having me. Well, you're coming back, and we'll pick up where we left off. And listen, um, thanks for being here, and thank everybody for listening in. And until next time, blessed be, and merry meet again. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. 
Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2009. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 